The Hound of the Baskervilles. Another Adventure of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter 4 Sir Henry Baskerville. Our breakfast table was cleared early, and Holmes waited in his dressing gown for the promised interview. Our clients were punctual to their appointment, for the clock had just struck ten when Dr. Mortimer was shown up, followed by the young baronet. The latter was a small, alert, dark-eyed man, about thirty years of age, very sturdily built, with thick black eyebrows and a strong, pugnacious face. He wore a ruddy-tinted tweed suit and had the weather-beaten appearance of one who has spent most of his time in the open air, and yet there was something in his steady eye and the quiet assurance of his bearing which indicated the gentleman. This is Sir Henry Baskerville, said Dr. Mortimer. Why, yes, said he. And the strange thing is, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, that if my friend here had not proposed coming round to you this morning, I should have come on my own account. I understand that you think out little puzzles, and I've had one this morning which wants more thinking out than I am able to give it. Pray take a seat, Sir Henry. Do I understand you, to say that you have yourself had some remarkable experience since you arrived in London? Nothing of much importance, Mr. Holmes. Only a joke, as like as not. It was this letter, if you can call it a letter, which reached me this morning. He laid an envelope upon the table, and we all bent over it. It was of common quality, greyish in colour. The address, Sir Henry Baskerville, Northumberland Hotel, was printed in rough characters, the postmark Charing Cross, and the date of posting the preceding evening. Who knew that you were going to the Northumberland Hotel? asked Holmes, glancing keenly across at our visitor. No one could have known. We only decided after I met Dr. Mortimer. But Dr. Mortimer was no doubt already stopping there. No, I had been staying with a friend, said the doctor. There was no possible indication that we intended to go to this hotel. Hmm, someone seems to be very deeply interested in your movements. Out of the envelope, he took a half sheet of foolscap paper folded into four. This he opened and spread flat upon the table. Across the middle of it, a single sentence had been formed by the expedient of pasting printed words upon it. It ran, As you value your life or your reason, keep away from the moor. The word moor only was printed in ink. Now, said Sir Henry Baskerville, Perhaps you will tell me, Mr. Holmes, what in thunder is the meaning of that, and who it is that takes so much interest in my affairs. What do you make of it, Dr. Mortimer? You must allow that there is nothing supernatural about this, at any rate. No, sir, but it might very well come from someone who was convinced that the business is supernatural. What business? asked Sir Henry sharply. It seems to me that all you gentlemen know a great deal more than I do about my own affairs. You shall share our knowledge before you leave this room, Sir Henry. I promise you that, said Sherlock Holmes. We will confine ourselves for the present with your permission to this very interesting document, which must have been put together and posted yesterday evening. Have you yesterday's times, Watson? It is here in the corner. Might I trouble you for it? The inside page, please, with the leading articles. He glanced swiftly over it, running his eyes up and down the columns. Capital article this on free trade. Permit me to give you an extract from it. You may be cajoled into imagining that your own special trade or your own industry will be encouraged by a protective tariff but it stands to reason that such legislation must in the long run keep away wealth from the country, diminish the value of our imports, and lower the general conditions of life in this Island. What do you think of that, Watson? cried Holmes in high glee, 
rubbing his hands together with satisfaction. Don't you think that is an admirable sentiment? Dr. Mortimer looked at Holmes with an air of professional interest, and Sir Henry Baskerville turned a pair of puzzled, dark eyes upon me. I don't know much about the tariff and things of that kind, said he, but it seems to me we've got a bit off the trail so far as that note is concerned. On the contrary, I think we are particularly hot upon the trail, Sir Henry. Watson here knows more about my methods than you do, but I fear that even he has not quite grasped the significance of this sentence. No, I confess that I see no connection. And yet, my dear Watson, there is so very close a connection that the one is extracted out of the other. You, your, your, life, reason, value, keep away, from thee. Don't you see now whence these words have been taken? By thunder, you're right. Well, if that isn't smart, cried Sir Henry. If any possible doubt remained, it is settled by the fact that keep away and from the are cut out in one piece. Well, now, so it is. Really, Mr. Holmes, this exceeds anything which I could have imagined, said Dr. Mortimer, gazing at my friend in amazement. I could understand anyone saying that the words were from a newspaper, but that you should name which and add that it came from the leading article is really one of the most remarkable things which I have ever known. How did you do it? I presume, Doctor, that you could tell the skull of a Negro from that of an Eskimo. Most certainly. But how? Because that is my special hobby. The differences are obvious. The supraorbital crest, the facial angle, the maxillary curve, the... But this is my special hobby. And the differences are equally obvious. There is as much difference to my eyes between the leaded bourgeois type of a Times article and the slovenly print of an evening halfpenny paper as there could be between your Negro and your Esquimo. The detection of types is one of the most elementary branches of knowledge to the special expert in crime, though I confess that once when I was very young I confused the Leeds Mercury with the Western Morning News. But a Times leader is entirely distinctive, and these words could have been taken from nothing else. As it was done yesterday, the strong probability was that we should find the words in yesterday's issue. So far as I can follow you then, Mr. Holmes, said Sir Henry Baskerville, someone cut out this message with a scissors. Nail scissors, said Holmes. You can see that it was a very short-bladed scissors, since the cutter had to take two snips over, keep away. That is so. Someone then cut out the message with a pair of short-bladed scissors, pasted it with paste. Gum, said Holmes, with gum onto the paper. But I want to know why the word more should have been written. Because he could not find it in print. The other words were all simple and might be found in any issue, but more would be less common. Why, of course, that would explain it. Have you read anything else in this message, Mr. Holmes? There are one or two indications, and yet the utmost pains have been taken to remove all clues. The address, you observe, is printed in rough characters, but the Times is a paper which is seldom found in any hands but those of the highly educated. We may take it, therefore, that the letter was composed by an educated man who wished to pose as an uneducated one, and his effort to conceal his own writing suggests that that writing might be known or come to be known by you. Again, you will observe that the words are not gummed on in an accurate line, but that some are much higher than others. Life, for example, is quite out of its proper place. That may point to carelessness, or it may point to agitation and hurry upon the part of the cutter. On the whole, I incline to the latter view, since the matter was evidently important, and it is unlikely that the composer of such a letter would be careless. If he were in a hurry, it opens up the interesting question why he should be in a hurry. 
since any letter posted up to early morning would reach Sir Henry before he would leave his hotel. Did the composer fear an interruption? And from whom? We are coming now rather into the region of guesswork, said Dr. Mortimer. Say, rather, into the region where we balance probabilities and choose the most likely. It is the scientific use of the imagination, but we have always some material basis on which to start our speculation. Now, you would call it a guess, no doubt, but I am almost certain that this address has been written in a hotel. How in the world can you say that? If you examine it carefully, you will see that both the pen and the ink have given the writer trouble. The pen has spluttered twice in a single word and has run dry three times in a short address, showing that there was very little ink in the bottle. Now, a private pen or ink bottle is seldom allowed to be in such a state, and the combination of the two must be quite rare. But you know the hotel ink and the hotel pen, where it is rare to get anything else. Yes, I have very little hesitation in saying that, could we examine the waste paper baskets of the hotels around Charing Cross until we found the remains of the mutilated Times leader, we could lay our hands straight upon the person who sent this singular message. Halloa! Halloa! What's this? He was carefully examining the foolscap upon which the words were pasted, holding it only an inch or two from his eyes. Well, nothing, said he, throwing it down. It is a blank half-sheet of paper, without even a watermark upon it. I think we have drawn as much as we can from this curious letter. And now, Sir Henry, has anything else of interest happened to you since you have been in London? Why, no, Mr. Holmes. I think not. You have not observed anyone follow or watch you. I seem to have walked right into the thick of a dime novel, said our visitor. Why in thunder should anyone follow or watch me? We are coming to that. You have nothing else to report to us before we go into this matter. Well, it depends upon what you think worth reporting. I think anything out of the ordinary routine of life well worth reporting. Sir Henry smiled. I don't know much of British life yet, for I have spent nearly all my time in the States and in Canada, but I hope that to lose one of your boots is not part of the ordinary routine of life over here. You have lost one of your boots. My dear sir, cried Dr. Mortimer, it is only mislaid. You will find it when you return to the hotel. What is the use of troubling Mr. Holmes with trifles of this kind? Well, he asked me for anything outside the ordinary routine. Exactly, said Holmes. However foolish the incident may seem, you have lost one of your boots, you say? Well, mislaid it anyhow. I put them both outside my door last night, and there was only one in the morning. I could get no sense out of the chap who cleans them. The worst of it is that I only bought the pair last night in the Strand, and I have never had them on. If you have never worn them, why did you put them out to be cleaned? They were tan boots and had never been varnished. That was why I put them out. Then I understand that on your arrival in London yesterday, you went out at once and bought a pair of boots. I did a good deal of shopping. Dr. Mortimer here went round with me. You see, if I am to be squire down there, I must dress the part, and it may be that I have got a little careless in my ways out west. Among other things, I bought these brown boots, gave six dollars for them, and had one stolen before ever I had them on my feet. It seems a singularly useless thing to steal, said Sherlock Holmes. I confess that I share Dr. Mortimer's belief that it will not be long before the missing boot is found. And now, gentlemen, said the baronet with decision, it seems to me that I have spoken quite enough about the little that I know. It is time that you kept your promise and gave me a full account of what we are all driving at. Your request is a very reasonable one, 
Holmes answered. Dr. Mortimer, I think you could not do better than to tell your story as you told it to us. Thus encouraged, our scientific friend drew his papers from his pocket and presented the whole case as he had done upon the morning before. Sir Henry Baskerville listened with the deepest attention and with an occasional exclamation of surprise. Well, I seem to have come into an inheritance with a vengeance, said he when the long narrative was finished. Of course, I've heard of the hound ever since I was in the nursery. It's the pet story of the family, though I never thought of taking it seriously before. But as to my uncle's death, well, it all seems boiling up in my head, and I can't get it clear yet. You don't seem quite to have made up your mind whether it's a case for a policeman or a clergyman. Precisely. And now there's this affair of the letter to me at the hotel. I suppose that fits into its place. It seems to show that someone knows more than we do about what goes on upon the moor, said Dr. Mortimer. And also, said Holmes, that someone is not ill-disposed towards you since they warn you of danger. Or it may be that they wish, for their own purposes, to scare me away. Well, of course, that is possible also. I am very much indebted to you, Dr. Mortimer, for introducing me to a problem which presents several interesting alternatives. But the practical point which we now have to decide, Sir Henry, is whether it is or is not advisable for you to go to Baskerville Hall. Why should I not go? There seems to be danger. Do you mean danger from this family fiend, or do you mean danger from human beings? Well, that is what we have to find out. Whichever it is, my answer is fixed. There is no devil in hell, Mr. Holmes, and there is no man upon earth who can prevent me from going to the home of my own people, and you may take that to be my final answer. His dark brows knitted, and his face flushed to a dusky red as he spoke. It was evident that the fiery temper of the Baskervilles was not extinct in this, their last representative. Meanwhile, said he, I have hardly had time to think over all that you have told me. It's a big thing for a man to have to understand and to decide at one sitting. I should like to have a quiet hour by myself to make up my mind. Now, look here, Mr. Holmes. It's half past eleven now, and I am going back right away to my hotel. Suppose you and your friend, Dr. Watson, come round and lunch with us at two. I'll be able to tell you more clearly then how this thing strikes me. Is that convenient to you, Watson? Perfectly. Then you may expect us. Shall I have a cab called? I'd prefer to walk, for this affair has flurried me rather. I'll join you in a walk with pleasure, said his companion. Then we meet again at two o'clock. Au revoir and good morning. We heard the steps of our visitors descend the stair and the bang of the front door. In an instant, Holmes had changed from the languid dreamer to the man of action. Your hat and boots, Watson, quick, not a moment to lose. He rushed into his room in his dressing gown and was back again in a few seconds in a frock coat. We hurried together down the stairs and into the street. Dr. Mortimer and Baskerville were still visible about two hundred yards ahead of us in the direction of Oxford Street. Shall I run on and stop them? Not for the world, my dear Watson. I am perfectly satisfied with your company, if you will tolerate mine. Our friends are wise, for it is certainly a very fine morning for a walk. He quickened his pace until we had decreased the distance which divided us by about half. Then, still keeping a hundred yards behind, we followed into Oxford Street and so down Regent Street. Once our friends stopped and stared into a shop window, upon which Holmes did the same. An instant afterwards, he gave a little cry of satisfaction and, following the direction of his eager eyes, I saw that a handsome cab with a man inside which had halted on the other side of the street was now proceeding slowly onward again. There's our man, 
Watson. Come along, we'll have a good look at him if we can do no more. At that instant I was aware of a bushy black beard and a pair of piercing eyes turned upon us through the side window of the cab. Instantly the trap door at the top flew up, something was screamed to the driver, and the cab flew madly off down Regent Street. Holmes looked eagerly round for another, but no empty one was in sight. Then he dashed in wild pursuit amid the stream of the traffic, but the start was too great and already the cab was out of sight. There now, said Holmes bitterly as he emerged panting and white with vexation from the tide of vehicles. Was ever such bad luck and such bad management too? Watson, Watson, if you are an honest man, you will record this also and set it against my successes. Who was the man? I have not an idea. A spy? Well, it was evident from what we have heard that Baskerville has been very closely shadowed by someone since he has been in town. How else could it be known so quickly that it was the Northumberland Hotel which he had chosen? If they had followed him the first day, I argued that they would follow him also the second. You may have observed that I twice strolled over to the window while Dr. Mortimer was reading his legend. Yes, I remember. I was looking out for loiterers in the street, but I saw none. We are dealing with a clever man, Watson. This matter cuts very deep, and though I have not finally made up my mind whether it is a benevolent or a malevolent agency which is in touch with us, I am conscious always of power and design. When our friends left, I at once followed them in the hopes of marking down their invisible attendant. So wily was he that he had not trusted himself upon foot, but he had availed himself of a cab so that he could loiter behind or dash past them, and so escape their notice. His method had the additional advantage that if they were to take a cab, he was all ready to follow them. It has, however, one obvious disadvantage. It puts him in the power of the cabman. Exactly. What a pity we did not get the number. My dear Watson, clumsy as I have been, you surely do not seriously imagine that I neglected to get the number? No. Tusavin 04 is our man. But that is no use to us for the moment. I fail to see how you could have done more. On observing the cab, I should have instantly turned and walked in the other direction. I should then, at my leisure, have hired a second cab and followed the first at a respectful distance or, better still, have driven to the Northumberland Hotel and waited there. When our unknown had followed Baskerville home, we should have had the opportunity of playing his own game upon himself and seeing where he made for. As it is, by an indiscreet eagerness, which was taken advantage of with extraordinary quickness and energy by our opponent, we have betrayed ourselves and lost our man. We had been sauntering slowly down Regent Street during this conversation, and Dr. Mortimer, with his companion, had long vanished in front of us. There is no object in our following them, said Holmes. The shadow has departed and will not return. We must see what further cards we have in our hands and play them with decision. Could you swear to that man's face within the cab? I could swear only to the beard. And so could I, from which I gather that in all probability it was a false one. A clever man upon so delicate an errand has no use for a beard save to conceal his features. Come in here, Watson. He turned into one of the district messenger offices where he was warmly greeted by the manager. Ah, Wilson, I see you have not forgotten the little case in which I had the good fortune to help you. No, sir, indeed, I have not. You saved my good name and perhaps my life. My dear fellow, you exaggerate. I have some recollection, Wilson, that you had among your boys a lad named Cartwright who showed some ability during the investigation. Yes, sir, he is still with us. 
Could you ring him up? Thank you. And I should be glad to have change of this five-pound note. A lad of fourteen, with a bright, keen face, had obeyed the summons of the manager. He stood now gazing with great reverence at the famous detective. Let me have the hotel directory, said Holmes. Thank you. Now, Cartwright, there are the names of twenty-three hotels here, all in the immediate neighbourhood of Charing Cross. Do you see? Yes, sir. You will visit each of these in turn. Yes, sir. You will begin in each case by giving the outside porter one shilling. Here are twenty-three shillings. Yes, sir. You will tell him that you want to see the waste paper of yesterday. You will say that an important telegram has miscarried and that you are looking for it. You understand? Yes, sir. But what you are really looking for is the centre page of the Times with some holes cut in it with scissors. Here is a copy of the Times. It is this page. You could easily recognise it, could you not? Yes, sir. In each case, the outside porter will send for the hall porter, to whom also you will give a shilling. Here are twenty-three shillings. You will then learn in possibly twenty cases out of the twenty-three that the waste of the day before has been burned or removed. In the three other cases, you will be shown a heap of paper and you will look for this page of the Times among it. The odds are enormously against your finding it. There are ten shillings over in case of emergencies. Let me have a report by wire at Baker Street before evening. And now, Watson, it only remains for us to find out by wire the identity of the cabman, number 2704, and then we will drop into one of the Bond Street picture galleries and fill in the time until we are due at the hotel. Chapter 5 3. Broken Threads Sherlock Holmes had, in a very remarkable degree, the power of detaching his mind at will. For two hours, the strange business in which we had been involved appeared to be forgotten, and he was entirely absorbed in the pictures of the modern Belgian masters. He would talk of nothing but art, of which he had the crudest ideas, from our leaving the gallery until we found ourselves at the Northumberland Hotel. Sir Henry Baskerville is upstairs expecting you, said the clerk. He asked me to show you up at once when you came. Have you any objection to my looking at your register? said Holmes. Not in the least. The book showed that two names had been added after that of Baskerville. One was Theophilus Johnson and family of Newcastle. The other, Mrs. Oldmore and Maid, of High Lodge, Alton. Surely that must be the same Johnson whom I used to know, said Holmes to the porter. A lawyer, is he not? Grey-headed? And walks with a limp? No, sir. This is Mr. Johnson, the coal owner, a very active gentleman, not older than yourself. Surely you are mistaken about his trade? No, sir. He has used this hotel for many years and he is very well known to us. Ah, that settles it. Mrs. Oldmore, too. I seem to remember the name. Excuse my curiosity, but often in calling upon one friend one finds another. She is an invalid lady, sir. Her husband was once mayor of Gloucester. She always comes to us when she is in town. Thank you. I am afraid I cannot claim her acquaintance. We have established a most important fact by these questions, Watson, he continued in a low voice as we went upstairs together. We know now that the people who are so interested in our friend have not settled down in his own hotel. That means that while they are, as we have seen, very anxious to watch him, they are equally anxious that he should not see them. Now, this is a most suggestive fact. What does it suggest? It suggests, Hallo, my dear fellow, what on earth is the matter? As we came round the top of the stairs, we had run up against Sir Henry Baskerville himself. His face was flushed with anger, 
and he held an old and dusty boot in one of his hands. So furious was he that he was hardly articulate, and when he did speak, it was in a much broader and more Western dialect than any which we had heard from him in the morning. Seems to me they are playing me for a sucker in this hotel, he cried. They'll find they've started in to monkey with the wrong man unless they are careful. By thunder, if that chap can't find my missing boot, there will be trouble. I can take a joke with the best, Mr. Holmes, but they've got a bit over the mark this time. Still looking for your boot? Yes, sir, and mean to find it. But surely you said that it was a new brown boot. So it was, sir. And now it's an old black one. What? You don't mean to say? That's just what I do mean to say. I only had three pairs in the world, the new brown, the old black, and the patent leathers, which I am wearing. Last night they took one of my brown ones, and today they have sneaked one of the black. Well, have you got it? Speak out, man, and don't stand staring. An agitated German waiter had appeared upon the scene. No, sir. I have made inquiry all over the hotel, but I can hear no word of it. Well, either that boot comes back before sundown, or I'll see the manager and tell him that I go right straight out of this hotel. It shall be found, sir. I promise you that, if you will have a little patience, it will be found. Mind it is, for it's the last thing of mine that I'll lose in this den of thieves. Well, well, Mr. Holmes, you'll excuse my troubling you about such a trifle. I think it's well worth troubling about. Why, you look very serious over it. How do you explain it? I just don't attempt to explain it. It seems the very maddest, queerest thing that ever happened to me. The queerest, perhaps, said Holmes thoughtfully. What do you make of it yourself? Well, I don't profess to understand it yet. This case of yours is very complex, Sir Henry. When taken in conjunction with your uncle's death, I am not sure that of all the five hundred cases of capital importance, which I have handled there is one which cuts so deep. But we hold several threads in our hands, and the odds are that one or other of them guides us to the truth. We may waste time in following the wrong one, but sooner or later we must come upon the right. We had a pleasant luncheon in which little was said of the business which had brought us together. It was in the private sitting room, to which we afterwards repaired, that Holmes asked Baskerville what were his intentions. To go to Baskerville Hall. And when? At the end of the week. On the whole, said Holmes. I think that your decision is a wise one. I have ample evidence that you are being dogged in London, and amid the millions of this great city it is difficult to discover who these people are or what their object can be. If their intentions are evil, they might do you a mischief, and we should be powerless to prevent it. You did not know, Dr. Mortimer, that you were followed this morning from my house? Dr. Mortimer started violently. Followed? By whom? That, unfortunately, is what I cannot tell you. Have you among your neighbours or acquaintances on Dartmoor any man with a black full beard? No, or let me see. Why, yes, Barrymore, Sir Charles's butler, is a man with a full black beard. Ha! Ah, where is Barrymore? He is in charge of the hall. We had best ascertain if he is really there, or if by any possibility he might be in London. How can you do that? Give me a telegraph form. Is all ready for Sir Henry? That will do. Address to Mr. Barrymore, Baskerville Hall. What is the nearest telegraph office? Grimpen. Very good. We will send a second wire to the postmaster. Grimpen. Telegram to Mr. Barrymore to be delivered into his own hand. If absent, please return wire to Sir Henry Baskerville, Northumberland Hotel. That should let us know before evening whether Barrymore is at his post in Devonshire or not. That's so, said Baskerville. By the way, Dr. Mortimer, who is this Barrymore, anyhow? 
He is the son of the old caretaker, who is dead. They have looked after the hall for four generations now. So far as I know, he and his wife are as respectable a couple as any in the county. At the same time, said Baskerville, it's clear enough that so long as there are none of the family at the hall, these people have a mighty fine home and nothing to do. That is true. Did Barrymore profit at all by Sir Charles's will? asked Holmes. He and his wife had five hundred pounds each. Ha! Did they know that they would receive this? Yes, Sir Charles was very fond of talking about the provisions of his will. That is very interesting. I hope, said Dr. Mortimer, that you do not look with suspicious eyes upon everyone who received a legacy from Sir Charles, for I also had a thousand pounds left to me. Indeed, and anyone else? There were many insignificant sums to individuals and a large number of public charities. The residue all went to Sir Henry. And how much was the residue? Seven hundred and forty thousand pounds. Holmes raised his eyebrows in surprise. I had no idea that so gigantic a sum was involved, said he. Sir Charles had the reputation of being rich, but we did not know how very rich he was until we came to examine his securities. The total value of the estate was close on to a million. Dear me, it is a stake for which a man might well play a desperate game. And one more question, Dr. Mortimer. Supposing that anything happened to our young friend here, you will forgive the unpleasant hypothesis, who would inherit the estate? Since Roger Baskerville, Sir Charles's younger brother, died unmarried, the estate would descend to the Desmonds, who are distant cousins. James Desmond is an elderly clergyman in Westmoreland. Thank you. These details are all of great interest. Have you met Mr. James Desmond? Yes, he once came down to visit Sir Charles. He is a man of venerable appearance and of saintly life. I remember that he refused to accept any settlement from Sir Charles, though he pressed it upon him. And this man of simple tastes would be the heir to Sir Charles's thousands. He would be the heir to the estate, because that is entailed. He would also be the heir to the money, unless it were willed otherwise by the present owner, who can, of course, do what he likes with it. And have you made your will, Sir Henry? No, Mr. Holmes, I have not. I've had no time, for it was only yesterday that I learned how matters stood. But in any case, I feel that the money should go with the title and estate. That was my poor uncle's idea. How is the owner going to restore the glories of the Baskervilles if he has not money enough to keep up the property? House, land and dollars must go together. Quite so. Well, Sir Henry, I am of one mind with you as to the advisability of your going down to Devonshire without delay. There is only one provision which I must make. You certainly must not go alone. Dr. Mortimer returns with me. But Dr. Mortimer has his practice to attend to, and his house is miles away from yours. With all the goodwill in the world, he may be unable to help you. No, Sir Henry, you must take with you someone, a trusty man who will be always by your side. Is it possible that you could come yourself, Mr. Holmes? If matters came to a crisis, I should endeavour to be present in person. But you can understand that, with my extensive consulting practice and with the constant appeals which reach me from many quarters, it is impossible for me to be absent from London for an indefinite time. At the present instant, one of the most revered names in England is being besmirched by a blackmailer, and only I can stop a disastrous scandal you will see how impossible it is for me to go to Dartmoor. Whom would you recommend, then? Holmes laid his hand upon my arm. If my friend would undertake it, there is no man who is better worth having at your side when you are in a tight place. No one can say so more confidently than I.
The proposition took me completely by surprise, but before I had time to answer, Baskerville seized me by the hand and wrung it heartily. Well, now, that is real kind of you, Dr. Watson, said he. You see how it is with me, and you know just as much about the matter as I do. If you will come down to Baskerville Hall and see me through, I'll never forget it. The promise of adventure had always a fascination for me, and I was complimented by the words of Holmes and by the eagerness with which the baronet hailed me as a companion. I will come with pleasure, said I. I do not know how I could employ my time better. And you will report very carefully to me, said Holmes. When a crisis comes, as it will do, I will direct how you shall act. I suppose that by Saturday all might be ready. Would that suit Dr. Watson? Perfectly. Then on Saturday, unless you hear to the contrary, we shall meet at the 10.30 train from Paddington. We had risen to depart when Baskerville gave a cry of triumph, and diving into one of the corners of the room, he drew a brown boot from under a cabinet. My missing boot, he cried. May all our difficulties vanish as easily, said Sherlock Holmes. But it is a very singular thing, Dr. Mortimer remarked. I searched this room carefully before lunch. And so did I, said Baskerville. Every inch of it. There was certainly no boot in it then. In that case, the waiter must have placed it there while we were lunching. The German was sent for, but professed to know nothing of the matter, nor could any inquiry clear it up. Another item had been added to that constant and apparently purposeless series of small mysteries which had succeeded each other so rapidly. Setting aside the whole grim story of Sir Charles's death, we had a line of inexplicable incidents all within the limits of two days, which included the receipt of the printed letter, the black-bearded spy in the hansom, the loss of the new brown boot, the loss of the old black boot, and now the return of the new brown boot. Holmes sat in silence in the cab as we drove back to Baker Street, and I knew from his drawn brows and keen face that his mind, like my own, was busy in endeavouring to frame some scheme into which all these strange and apparently disconnected episodes could be fitted. All afternoon and late into the evening, he sat lost in tobacco and thought. Just before dinner, two telegrams were handed in. The first ran, Have just heard that Barrymore is at the Hall, Baskerville. The second, Visited 23 hotels as directed, but sorry to report, unable to trace, cut sheet of times. Cartwright. There go two of my threads, Watson. There is nothing more stimulating than a case where everything goes against you. We must cast round for another scent. We have still the cabman who drove the spy. Exactly. I have wired to get his name and address from the official registry. I should not be surprised if this were an answer to my question. The ring at the bell proved to be something even more satisfactory than an answer, however, for the door opened and a rough-looking fellow entered who was evidently the man himself. I got a message from the head office that a gent at this address had been inquiring for number 22704, said he. I've driven my cab this seven years and never a word of complaint. I came here straight from the yard to ask you to your face what you had against me. I have nothing in the world against you, my good man, said Holmes. On the contrary, I have half a sovereign for you if you will give me a clear answer to my questions. Well, I've had a good day and no mistake, said the cabman with a grin. What was it you wanted to ask, sir? First of all, your name and address, in case I want you again. John Clayton, 3 Turpey Street, The Borough. My cab is out of Shipley's Yard, near Waterloo Station. Sherlock Holmes made a note of it. Now, Clayton, tell me all about the fair who came and watched this house at ten o'clock this morning. 
and afterwards followed the two gentlemen down Regent Street. The man looked surprised and a little embarrassed. Why? There's no good my telling you things, for you seem to know as much as I do already, said he. The truth is that the gentleman told me that he was a detective and that I was to say nothing about him to anyone. My good fellow, this is a very serious business, and you may find yourself in a pretty bad position if you try to hide anything from me. You say that your fare told you that he was a detective? Yes, he did. When did he say this? When he left me. Did he say anything more? He mentioned his name. Holmes cast a swift glance of triumph at me. Oh, he mentioned his name, did he? That was imprudent. What was the name that he mentioned? His name, said the cabman, was Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Never have I seen my friend more completely taken aback than by the cabman's reply. For an instant, he sat in silent amazement. Then he burst into a hearty laugh. A touch, Watson, an undeniable touch, said he. I feel a foil as quick and supple as my own. He got home upon me very prettily that time. So his name was Sherlock Holmes, was it? Yes, sir. That was the gentleman's name. Excellent. Tell me where you picked him up and all that occurred. He hailed me at half past nine in Trafalgar Square. He said that he was a detective, and he offered me two guineas if I would do exactly what he wanted all day and ask no questions. I was glad enough to agree. First, we drove down to the Northumberland Hotel and waited there until two gentlemen came out and took a cab from the rank. We followed their cab until it pulled up somewhere near here. This very door, said Holmes. Well, I couldn't be sure of that, but I dare say my fare knew all about it. We pulled up halfway down the street and waited an hour and a half. Then the two gentlemen passed us, walking, and we followed down Baker Street and along. I know, said Holmes, until we got three quarters down Regent Street. Then my gentleman threw up the trap, and he cried that I should drive right away to Waterloo Station as hard as I could go. I whipped up the mare, and we were there under the ten minutes. Then he paid up his two guineas, like a good one, and away he went into the station. Only just as he was leaving, he turned round and he said, It might interest you to know that you have been driving Mr. Sherlock Holmes. That's how I come to know the name. I see. And you saw no more of him. Not after he went into the station. And how would you describe Mr. Sherlock Holmes? The cabman scratched his head. Well, he wasn't altogether such an easy gentleman to describe. I'd put him at forty years of age, and he was of a middle height, two or three inches shorter than you, sir. He was dressed like a toff, and he had a black beard, cut square at the end, and a pale face. I don't know as I could say more than that. Colour of his eyes? No, I can't say that. Nothing more that you can remember. No, sir, nothing. Well, then, here is your half-sovereign. There's another one waiting for you if you can bring any more information. Good night. Good night, sir, and thank you. John Clayton departed, chuckling, and Holmes turned to me with a shrug of his shoulders and a rueful smile. Snap goes our third thread, and we end where we began, said he. The cunning rascal. He knew our number, knew that Sir Henry Baskerville had consulted me, spotted who I was in Regent Street, conjectured that I had got the number of the cab and would lay my hands on the driver, and so sent back this audacious message. I tell you, Watson, this time we have got a foeman who is worthy of our steel. I've been checkmated in London. I can only wish you better luck in Devonshire, but I'm not easy in my mind about it. About what? About sending you. It's an ugly business, Watson, an ugly, dangerous business, and the more I see of it, the less I like it. Yes, my dear fellow, you may laugh, 
but I give you my word that I shall be very glad to have you back safe and sound in Baker Street once more. Chapter 6 Baskerville Hall Sir Henry Baskerville and Dr. Mortimer were ready upon the appointed day, and we started as arranged for Devonshire. Mr. Sherlock Holmes drove with me to the station and gave me his last parting injunctions and advice. I will not bias your mind by suggesting theories or suspicions, Watson, said he. I wish you simply to report facts in the fullest possible manner to me, and you can leave me to do the theorizing. What sort of facts? I asked. Anything which may seem to have a bearing, however indirect, upon the case, and especially the relations between young Baskerville and his neighbours, or any fresh particulars concerning the death of Sir Charles. I have made some inquiries myself in the last few days, but the results have, I fear, been negative. One thing only appears to be certain, and that is that Mr. James Desmond, who is the next heir, is an elderly gentleman of a very amiable disposition, so that this persecution does not arise from him. I really think that we may eliminate him. Entirely from our calculations, there remain the people who will actually surround Sir Henry Baskerville upon the moor. Would it not be well in the first place to get rid of this Barrymore couple? By no means. You could not make a greater mistake. If they are innocent, it would be a cruel injustice, and if they are guilty, we should be giving up all chance of bringing it home to them. No, no, we will preserve them upon our list of suspects. Then there is a groom at the hall, if I remember right. There are two moorland farmers. There is our friend Dr. Mortimer, whom I believe to be entirely honest, and there is his wife, of whom we know nothing. There is this naturalist, Stapleton, and there is his sister, who is said to be a young lady of attractions. There is Mr. Frankland, of Laughter Hall, who is also an unknown factor, and there are one or two other neighbours. These are the folk who must be your very special study. I will do my best. You have arms, I suppose. Yes, I thought it as well to take them. Most certainly. Keep your revolver near you night and day, and never relax your precautions. Our friends had already secured a first-class carriage and were waiting for us upon the platform. No, we have no news of any kind, said Dr. Mortimer in answer to my friend's questions. I can swear to one thing, and that is that we have not been shadowed during the last two days. We have never gone out without keeping a sharp watch, and no one could have escaped our notice. You have always kept together, I presume? Except yesterday afternoon. I usually give up one day to pure amusement when I come to town, so I spent it at the Museum of the College of Surgeons. And I went to look at the folk in the park, said Baskerville, but we had no trouble of any kind. It was imprudent all the same, said Holmes, shaking his head and looking very grave. I beg, Sir Henry, that you will not go about alone. Some great misfortune will befall you if you do. Did you get your other boot? No, sir, it is gone forever. Indeed, that is very interesting. Well, goodbye, he added as the train began to glide down the platform. Bear in mind, Sir Henry, one of the phrases in that queer old legend which Dr. Mortimer has read to us, and avoid the moor in those hours of darkness when the powers of evil are exalted. I looked back at the platform when we had left it far behind and saw the tall, austere figure of Holmes standing motionless and gazing after us. The journey was a swift and pleasant one, and I spent it in making the more intimate acquaintance of my two companions and in playing with Dr. Mortimer's spaniel. In a very few hours, the brown earth had become ruddy, the brick had changed to granite, and red cows grazed in well-hedged fields where the lush grasses and more luxuriant vegetation spoke of a richer 
if a damper, climate. Young Baskerville stared eagerly out of the window and cried aloud with delight as he recognised the familiar features of the Devon scenery. I've been over a good part of the world since I left it, Dr. Watson, said he, but I have never seen a place to compare with it. I never saw a Devonshire man who did not swear by his county, I remarked. It depends upon the breed of men quite as much as on the county, said Dr. Mortimer. A glance at our friend here reveals the rounded head of the Celt, which carries inside it the Celtic enthusiasm and power of attachment. Poor Sir Charles's head was of a very rare type, half Gaelic, half Ivernian in its characteristics. But you were very young when you last saw Baskerville Hall, were you not? I was a boy in my teens at the time of my father's death and had never seen the hall, for he lived in a little cottage on the south coast. Thence I went straight to a friend in America. I tell you, it is all as new to me as it is to Dr. Watson, and I'm as keen as possible to see them more. Are you? Then your wish is easily granted, for there is your first sight of the moor, said Dr. Mortimer, pointing out of the carriage window. Over the green squares of the fields and the low curve of a wood there rose in the distance a grey, melancholy hill, with a strange jagged summit dim and vague in the distance, like some fantastic landscape in a dream. Baskerville sat for a long time, his eyes fixed upon it, and I read upon his eager face how much it meant to him this first zeet of that strange spot where the men of his blood had held sway so long and left their mark so deep. There he sat, with his tweed suit and his American accent, in the corner of a prosaic railway carriage. And yet, as I looked at his dark and expressive face, I felt more than ever how true a descendant he was of that long line of high-blooded, fiery and masterful men. There were pride, valour and strength in his thick brows, his sensitive nostrils and his large hazel eyes. If on that forbidding moor a difficult and dangerous quest should lie before us, this was at least a comrade for whom one might venture to take a risk with the certainty that he would bravely share it. The train pulled up at a small wayside station, and we all descended. Outside, beyond the low white fence, a wagonette with a pair of cobs was waiting. Our coming was evidently a great event, for station master and porters clustered round us to carry out our luggage. It was a sweet, simple country spot, but I was surprised to observe that by the gate there stood two soldierly men in dark uniforms who leaned upon their short rifles and glanced keenly at us as we passed. The coachman, a hard-faced, gnarled little fellow, saluted Sir Henry Baskerville, and in a few minutes we were flying swiftly down the broad white road. Rolling pasture lands curved upward on either side of us, and old gabled houses peeped out from amid the thick green foliage. But behind the peaceful and sunlit countryside there rose ever dark against the evening sky, the long gloomy curve of the moor broken by the jagged and sinister hills. The wagonette swung round into a side road, and we curved upward through deep lanes worn by centuries of wheels, high banks on either side, heavy with dripping moss and fleshy heart's tongue ferns. Bronzing bracken and mottled bramble gleamed in the light of the sinking sun. Still steadily rising, we passed over a narrow granite bridge and skirted a noisy stream which gushed swiftly down, foaming and roaring, amid the grey boulders. Both road and stream wound up through a valley, dense with scrub oak and fir. At every turn, Baskerville gave an exclamation of delight, looking eagerly about him and asking countless questions. To his eyes all seemed beautiful, but to me a tinge of melancholy lay upon the countryside, which bore so clearly the mark of the waning year. Yellow leaves carpeted the lanes and fluttered down upon us as we passed. 
the rattle of our wheels died away as we drove through drifts of rotting vegetation. Sad gifts, as it seemed to me, for nature to throw before the carriage of the returning heir of the Baskervilles. Hello, cried Dr. Mortimer. What is this? A steep curve of heath-clad land, an outlying spur of the moor, lay in front of us. On the summit, hard and clear like an equestrian statue, upon its pedestal was a mounted soldier, dark and stern, his rifle poised ready over his forearm. He was watching the road along which we travelled. What is this, Perkins? asked Dr. Mortimer. Our driver half turned in his seat. There's a convict escaped from Princetown, sir. He's been out three days now, and the warders watch every road and every station, but they've had no sight of him yet. The farmers about here don't like it, sir, and that's a fact. Well, I understand that they get five pounds if they can give information. Yes, sir, but the chance of five pounds is but a poor thing compared to the chance of having your throat cut. You see, it isn't like any ordinary convict. This is a man that would stick at nothing. Who is he, then? It is Selden, the Notting Hill murderer. I remembered the case well for it was one in which Holmes had taken an interest on account of the peculiar ferocity of the crime and the wanton brutality which had marked all the actions of the assassin. The commutation of his death sentence had been due to some doubts as to his complete sanity, so atrocious was his conduct. Our wagonetti had topped a rice, and in front of us rose the Hugue expansi of the moor mottled with gnarlied and craggy cairns and tors. A cold wind swept down from it and set us shivering. Somewhere there, on that desolate plain, was lurking this fiendish man, hiding in a burrow like a wild beast, his heart full of malignancy against the whole race which had cast him out. It needed but this to complete the grim suggestiveness of the barren waste the chilling wind and the darkling sky. Even Baskerville fell silent and pulled his overcoat more closely around him. We had left the fertile country behind and beneath us. We looked back on it now, the slanting rays of a low sun turning the streams to threads of gold and glowing on the red earth new, turned by the plough and the broad tangle of the woodlands. The road in front of us grew bleaker and wilder over huge russet and olive slopes sprinkled with giant boulders. Now and then we passed a moorland cottage, walled and roofed with stone, with no creeper to break its harsh outline. Suddenly we looked down into a cup-like depression, patched with stunted oaks and firs which had been twisted and bent by the fury of years of storm. Two high, narrow towers rose over the trees. The driver pointed with his whip. Baskerville Hall, said he. Its master had risen and was staring with flushed cheeks and shining eyes. A few minutes later we had reached the lodge gates, a maze of fantastic tracery in wrought iron, with weather-bitten pillars on either side, blotched with lichens, and surmounted by the boar's heads of the Baskervilles. The lodge was a ruin of black granite and bared ribs of rafters, but facing it was a new building, half constructed, the first fruit of Sir Charles's South African gold. Through the gateway we passed into the avenue, where the wheels were again hushed amid the leaves, and the old trees shot their branches in a sombre tunnel over our heads. Baskerville shuddered as he looked up the long, dark drive to where the house glimmered like a ghost at the farther end. Was it here? he asked in a low voice. No, no, the yew alley is on the other side. The young heir glanced round with a gloomy face. It's no wonder my uncle felt as if trouble were coming on him in such a place as this, said he. It's enough to scare any man. I'll have a row of electric lamps up here inside of six months, and you won't know it again, with a thousand candle-power Swan and Edison right here in front of the hall door. 
The avenue opened into a broad expanse of turf, and the house lay before us. In the fading light, I could see that the centre was a heavy block of building from which a porch projected. The whole front was draped in ivy, with a patch clipped bare here and there, where a window or a coat of arms broke through the dark veil. From this central block rose the twin towers, ancient, crenellated, and pierced with many loopholes. To right and left of the turrets were more modern wings of black granite. A dull light shone through heavy mullioned windows, and from the high chimneys which rose from the steep high-angled roof there sprang a single black column of smoke. Welcome, Sir Henry. Welcome to Baskerville Hall. A tall man had stepped from the shadow of the porch to open the door of the wagonette. The figure of a woman was silhouetted against the yellow light of the hall. She came out and helped the man to hand down our bags. You don't mind my driving straight home, Sir Henry, said Dr. Mortimer. My wife is expecting me. Surely you will stay and have some dinner? No, I must go. I shall probably find some work awaiting me. I would stay to show you over the house, but Barrymore will be a better guide than I. Goodbye, and never hesitate night or day to send for me, if I can be of service. The wheels died away down the drive, while Sir Henry and I turned into the hall, and the door clanged heavily behind us. It was a fine apartment in which we found ourselves, large, lofty, and heavily raftered with huge bulks of age-blackened oak. In the great old-fashioned fireplace behind the high iron dogs, a log fire crackled and snapped. Sir Henry and I held out our hands to it, for we were numb from our long drive. Then we gazed round us at the high, thin window of old stained glass, the oak panelling, the stag's heads, the coats of arms upon the walls, all dim and sombre in the subdued light of the central lamp. It's just as I imagined it, said Sir Henry. Is it not the very picture of an old family home? To think that this should be the same hall in which for five hundred years my people have lived. It strikes me solemn to think of it. I saw his dark face lit up with a boyish enthusiasm as he gazed about him. The light beat upon him where he stood, but long shadows trailed down the walls and hung like a black canopy above him. Barrymore had returned from taking our luggage to our rooms. He stood in front of us now with the subdued manner of a well-trained servant. He was a remarkable-looking man, tall, handsome, with a square black beard and pale, distinguished features. Would you wish dinner to be served at once, sir? Is it ready? In a very few minutes, sir. You will find hot water in your rooms. My wife and I will be happy, Sir Henry, to stay with you until you have made your fresh arrangements, but you will understand that under the new conditions this house will require a considerable staff. What new conditions? I only meant, sir, that Sir Charles led a very retired life, and we were able to look after his wants. You would, naturally, wish to have more company, and so you will need changes in your household. Do you mean that your wife and you wish to leave? Only when it is quite convenient to you, sir. But your family have been with us for several generations, have they not? I should be sorry to begin my life here by breaking an old family connection. I seem to discern some signs of emotion upon the butler's white face. I feel that also, sir, and so does my wife. But to tell the truth, sir, we were both very much attached to Sir Charles, and his death gave us a shock and made these surroundings very painful to us. I fear that we shall never again be easy in our minds at Baskerville Hall. But what do you intend to do? I have no doubt, sir, that we shall succeed in establishing ourselves in some business. Sir Charles's generosity has given us the means to do so. And now, sir, perhaps I had best show you to your rooms. A square balustraded gallery ran round the top of the old hall, approached by a double stair. From this central point, 
Two long corridors extended the whole length of the building, from which all the bedrooms opened. My own was in the same wing as Baskerville's and almost next door to it. These rooms appeared to be much more modern than the central part of the house, and the bright paper and numerous candles did something to remove the sombre impression which our arrival had left upon my mind. But the dining room which opened out of the hall was a place of shadow and gloom. It was a long chamber with a step separating the dais where the family sat from the lower portion reserved for their dependents. At one end, a minstrel's gallery overlooked it. Black beams shot across above our heads with a smoke-darkened ceiling beyond them, with rows of flaring torches to light it up and the colour and rude hilarity of an old-time banquet. It might have softened. But now, when two black-clothed gentlemen sat in the little circle of light thrown by a shaded lamp, one's voice became hushed and one's spirit subdued. A dim line of ancestors, in every variety of dress, from the Elizabethan knight to the buck of the regency, stared down upon us and daunted us by their silent company. We talked little and I for one was glad when the meal was over and we were able to retire into the modern billiard room and smoke a cigarette. My word, it isn't a very cheerful place, said Sir Henry. I suppose one can tone down to it, but I feel a bit out of the picture at present. I don't wonder that my uncle got a little jumpy if he lived all alone in such a house as this. However, if it suits you, we will retire early tonight, and perhaps things may seem more cheerful in the morning. I drew aside my curtains before I went to bed and looked out from my window. It opened upon the grassy space which lay in front of the hall door. Beyond, two copses of trees moaned and swung in a rising wind. A half-moon broke through the rifts of racing clouds. In its cold light, I saw beyond the trees a broken fringe of rocks and the long, low curve of the melancholy moor. I closed the curtain, feeling that my last impression was in keeping with the rest. And yet it was not quite the last. I found myself weary and yet wakeful, tossing restlessly from side to side, seeking for the sleep which would not come. Far away a chiming clock struck out the quarters of the hours, but otherwise a deathly silence lay upon the old house. And then suddenly, in the very dead of the night, there came a sound to my ears, clear, resonant, and unmistakable. It was the sob of a woman, the muffled, strangling gasp of one who is torn by an uncontrollable sorrow. I sat up in bed, and listened intently. The noise could not have been far away and was certainly in the house. For half an hour I waited with every nerve on the alert, but there came no other sound save the chiming clock and the rustle of the ivy on the wall.